Hey there, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the podcast. My name is Daniel Trinum, and I will be your host as always. Before we get started with today's episode, I want to let you know of a few things of note. First, you may or may not be aware that I host another podcast called The Third Seat. The Third Seat is unrelated to the podcast you are listening to right now, but if you'd like to check it out, then I will put a link in the description of today's episode that you can use to listen to it. If you like this podcast, then I really think you will like The Third Seat as well, so I highly recommend you check it out. Next, I want to let you know of a few ways you can support the podcast. First, be sure to tell a friend if you enjoy the show. Word of mouth is not only a great way to help support the show, but it's also zero cost. Secondly, if you enjoyed today's episode, then be sure to leave a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. Leaving a positive review is one of the best ways of not only supporting the show, but it also gives me direct feedback from you regarding how you feel about the show overall. I greatly appreciate if you decide to take the time to support the show in any of these ways. Finally, if you'd like to follow me or the show on social media, then feel free to check out the description of today's episode. Here you will find all affiliated and mentioned links, as well as how you can support the show online. As always, I want to thank you for tuning into and supporting the show. It really means a lot to me, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I enjoyed making it for you. But first, I'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's episode, Lucky to Know You Apparel. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever loved your friend so much that you just want to squeeze them until they explode? Well, this local Chattanooga-based clothing brand wants to portray that feeling into a community that appreciates the people in their lives. Today's sponsor, Lucky to Know You Apparel, is using fashion and feelings to bring people together, making them ecstatically say, can you believe we happen to exist at the same time? Check out their Instagram, at Lucky to Know You Apparel, and website, www.luckytoknowyou.com, to purchase your own apparel or gift one to a friend. Listeners of this podcast can use code FEELINGLUCKY for 15% off your next order. Again, that is code FEELINGLUCKY, spelled F-E-E-L-I-N-L-U-C-K-Y, at checkout for 15% off your next order. And hey, if no one has told you today, we are lucky to know you. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. My name is Daniel Trinum. I will be your host for this episode as always. And I'm excited to bring you all today's episode, today's conversation. Uh, it's with someone who has a lot of expertise, uh, who was actually given a recommendation by me uh, from someone I've talked to previously uh, on some different shows. And today, uh, my guest is someone who has a lot of expertise in a field that I am very unfamiliar with, but I am very eager to hopefully learn more about that field uh, and all the different things that she does. So it is my pleasure to have Dr. Kelly Mueller on the show today. So Kelly, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much. This is my first ever podcast. Well, so well welcome excited. aboard. <laughs> super excited, a little nervous. No, you'll be fine. Yeah. So uh, for those that aren't aware of just you and your story and what it is that you do, do you care to just share a little bit of insight about who you are and what is it what it is that you do now? Yeah, absolutely. So um, like you said, I'm Dr. Kelly Mueller. I'm originally from Wisconsin. Oh, actually. I, can, I can hear it now. <laughs> <laughs> I usually sneak through with my accent, yeah. except when I say Wisconsin. Yeah, and then and you, you pull it out right then. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just can't <laughs> get away with that part of it. Um, but I moved here about two and a half years ago, and I recently started my practice, Key to Change Wellness. So I'm a physical therapist by training and now a new business owner. So that's been an adventure. <laughs> that's awesome. That is awesome. It's funny. I'm, you mentioned being from Wisconsin and and. So I'm not from Chattanooga. I'm from about an hour up the road. I don't know if you're familiar with Athens at all. Athens, Tennessee, if you're not, it's not a huge place. So I'm not going to be upset if you're not aware of it. But uh, I, I don't have the strongest, like there are certainly people that have much stronger Southern accents than I do. But I'm, I know I've done it on the show before. If I get real excited or real animated about something, it just starts coming out like left and right. Like I'm just pulling out the y'alls and the stuff. And like you can hear that just the Southern drawl and everything in it. So it's funny. It's funny how those, you know, accents from where we're from just come out at the at the strangest times you know so absolutely my um physical therapy assistant i worked with at the last place that i was at before i started my business she's yeah. from saudi daisy so oh, yeah it took yeah. me a while to understand her and now she's my go-to <laughs> translator for like yeah. the really thick southern drawl yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you have do you find yourself like has it has it come on to you at all like do you find yourself like kind of 
like mixing north north middle i guess is where Wisconsin. or what is what what is Wisconsin? wisconsin um do you ever find yourself mixing like your wisconsin accent with like southern at all is it like mixed or is it, is it still like a hard cut off with the southern accent well, I feel like I knew I had been here long enough yeah. when I went from thinking like y'all sounded like I was really forcing it yeah. to act like I was a yeah. Southerner yeah. now um, to feeling like you all yeah. just takes so much time. Yeah. You know, it really is more efficient to say y'all. Yeah, I, I, it really is. And I'll say, listen, say what you want about, you know, Southern slang and I'm not going to sit here and defend all of it, but the, but that is one thing like that's I think that's for what it is like that's a good inclusion i think i think making that like a part of the vo vocabulary is a good idea you know mm -hmm. it's very it's very convenient to you so absolutely <laughs> I, I promise this whole podcast is not going to be dedicated to southern slang but i just like to talk about it so um anyways so you recently uh how long ago did you start your your current practice i started it in june of last year so now that you're i guess it's kind of almost June. It's like what three at the time of this recording, three or four months until then. So you're somewhat approaching your one year uh, of, of opening it. What are your just kind of looking back so far? What are your thoughts on how things have been and just what your experience as a new business owner has been for you? Yeah, it has been such a learning curve yeah. for me in like all of the best ways mm -hmm. though. Um, when I started my practice, I named it Key to Change Wellness instead of physical therapy because my boyfriend is actually a chiropractor. And mm -hmm. at the time we had been dating for almost a year and I just thought, you know, well, whether it's him or if I want to add something else in the future, maybe I want to have the flexibility of not just exactly. being a physical therapy practice. Yeah. Well, little did I know that five months later I'd be adding him. <laughs> <laughs> and so we quickly evolved from a physical therapy only practice mm -hmm. to offering PT and chiropractic yeah. and kind of entering into corporate wellness yeah. too, which is his passion. So it has just grown and evolved so much. And I think the biggest thing that I've learned is just how important it is to be able to pivot mm -hmm. because I have had to pivot nonstop since yeah. I started. And now I feel like I'm finally in a good flow, which yeah. is nice. It, you know, it's funny you say that. So I was, I am not a business owner. This is the closest thing I am to a business this owner. Totally and totally counts. <laughs> well, I, well, I mean, you know, it's when you know whatever but it's it's you know very very small scale but i, I was uh talking to someone um so th at the time of this recording this episode isn't out yet but you know the uh you know the bookstore over by hanover street the book and cover mm -hmm. have you heard okay yep. so i was talking to one of the owners on the show uh, a couple days ago and their episode will hopefully probably be out maybe hopefully by the time this doesn't but whatever um and they had mentioned how looking back at where they've come from and when, when they started it was their, their words were it's been like drinking from a like a fire hose like just all the things you've learned and that seems to be like the prevailing thought at least with with new business owners but in a good way like i know obviously i'm sure being a business owner in any regard whether it's a bookstore your own wellness uh, wellness practice like there's going to be so many things that i imagine you think you're prepared for, or you think you know about, or, you know, what, like you think you have a contingency plan for it. But then, uh, once the, you know, the wheels start turning and things start happening, you probably realize there's a lot more you have to learn, but that can be exciting. I think that yeah. to me, that sounds like a daunting yet exciting task, at least in my mind, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that sums it up really well because <laughs> I feel like I did a lot of research on the front end. I hired a business coach right mm -hmm. off the bat, but I still could not be prepared for yeah. the way that things were going to grow yeah. and meld and yeah. kind of change into what it is now. But yeah. I wouldn't really have it any other way. Moved clinics three times in like six months. Yeah. Finally feels comfortable with where we are. That's awesome. So it's just, yeah, it's been um, adapting and going with the flow and talking yourself out of some doom and gloom days where you're I'm like, sure. what did I do <laughs> in my life? And I have this doctorate degree and I'm like bleeding money. But <laughs> I also am really good about like DIYing everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I took all of the free time that I had with starting the business to do my own website and, you know, really lean into trying to just figure everything out and do my own bookkeeping and kind of really take on the, I want to know all the pieces yeah. of my business. So then if I do hand stuff off, I have a really good understanding of that. Yeah. And I think as well, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but to me specifically regarding this, but just in general, like things that if you don't, in the beginning, you don't necessarily feel proficient in doing it, or you may not be the expert in learning how to find a solution or learning how to do something like I, I know zero about like 
edited like from a from a very technical like mm -hmm. you ever seen like pictures of people like in a studio somewhere and they're like splicing things and like cutting this out like <laughs> none of that I'm, that's not my forte don't know how to do it but i i you know for me i was able to find a workaround for it and like being able to now do something on my own create it it, there's a sense of pride in that. It's like, I created this thing, you know, like I did it. I didn't know how to do it before. And now I can say I can do it. And I would say it's probably amplified to the whatever degree when, you know, your, your whole career is, you know, is, is, uh, kind of staked on it to a degree, you know? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't have anyone to blame a busy schedule on anymore. <laughs> like when I have three new evaluations in yeah. a row, I did that to myself. Yeah. And one thing that um, Johnny, my boyfriend, and I always say is we don't dread Mondays mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. And we felt that way in like our corporate mm -hmm. jobs. Yeah. And so it's really nice to get to your week. And even though you're like, dang, I'm really busy this week, it's like an excitement yeah. behind that, not a dread. Yeah. So, so on that note, and you don't have to name any names or anything, but how long prior to you opening your current practice did you work in like the corporate field? So I graduated from PT school in 2018 mm -hmm. and I worked in private practice in Wisconsin for my first two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then I moved here and took a clinic manager role. So yes. about four years total. I've been a PT now for about five years. Um, and working in that private practice setting was really good exposure to a little bit of marketing and a mm -hmm. little bit of sales, like just enough to give me a taste of like, I could, I could handle this on my own. It's not gonna be easy, but I could handle it. Yeah. And so um, that exposure was really nice. And during that time too, I also did an orthopedic residency and sat for my board certification for orthopedics. So I got a lot of continuing education in right on the start. And so I felt like, okay, I've got enough experience, yeah. even though it's only five years <laughs> to feel like confident enough yeah. to like, Hey, yeah. let's try it. What's the worst case scenario? You yeah. don't have kids. I just moved here with my dog. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> why not try it? So what made you want to, was it any specific reason that made you want to take, kind of take that leap? Was it, was it kind of the spirit of, Hey, why not? Or was it more of a, you were, you were just wanting to try something new or like, what was it? What was the moment for you that like made you really want to, uh, kind of take this leap of faith and go forward with it, if that makes sense. For sure. It was really how I saw the field change in five years mm -hmm. and the quality that I was able to deliver with my patients because I started out seeing, you know, one person at a time, about eight people a day. Mm -hmm. And in my most recent job, I was expected to see two at a minimum, sometimes three people at a time mm -hmm. and spending an hour with three people. So mm -hmm. constantly multitasking, wearing myself down, having some of my own physical pain pop up because I was thinking <laughs> I could still do it all the yeah. same way as I had treated my one-on-one yeah. -on -one clients. Yeah. And I just kind of looked at where I was at and I'm like, you know, I've grown so much. Like I have this um, board certification. Mm -hmm. I am a clinic manager. Like I've done all of these achievements mm -hmm. and I don't feel like happy yeah. about where I am yeah. and the energy I still have left to give at the end of the day. So I thought, you know, if I do have kids someday, like, how can I sustain this? Mm -hmm. And so I just thought, you know, for how I want to treat being a really hands-on provider, really realizing that like, yeah, people come in and they have physical pain, but there's usually so many layers below that. Yeah. And we spend so much time with people. I mean, I might spend 12 hours with somebody in their plan of care. In like, in like one sitting? No, in their, oh. in, <laughs> that would be a really, yeah, it's, it's a full sleepover. I the <laughs> Like, I, I don't know if I'm excited by the fact that my doctor wants to be that invested in who, in, you know, in my health or if I'm scared of having to like sleep over and, you know, they're in their office or whatever. So no, in their plan of care. But if you think about it, like I see my primary care provider once a year yeah. and I see her for maybe 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So like when people are coming in for two to three times a week for six weeks, they're telling me a lot of things that they may not have told any other provider. Yeah. And I love that side of it. I love acknowledging that there's a whole person behind a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I was starting to realize that it was almost getting to be like as bad as it sounds an inconvenience when mm -hmm. somebody was like more complicated or they weren't following this nice steady path of improvement, which we know is normal, yeah. but being spread so thin, I was like, oh, I'm like looking at this and being exhausted by it instead of being passionate. Mm -hmm. Like I came into the field as, so I wanted to make a change. And yeah. That's what led me to it. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so now that you're, you have your own practice, now that you're doing your own thing, uh, what specifically, I know you said your, your boyfriend, he does a lot of chiropractic work and I want to, I definitely want to ask about that cause I'm very curious about it. But, uh, what specifically do you focus on whenever you're with, I mean, I'm sure it's very different from person to person and there's no 
there's no standard protocol for, you know, that just is an umbrella for each person, but specifically what it is, what do you specialize in that you bring to the table? If, you know, if I were to walk into your doors right now, what is it that you offer and you hope to bring for the table for each, each client, if that makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's very timely for me being here. Cause we just finished this big, like branding workshop yeah. and really trying to define that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Cause like I said, it's been so much pivoting. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of a jack of all trades provider. Mm -hmm. And so it's been difficult as a business owner to really try to determine yeah. that niche and like lean into it. Mm -hmm. And so what we really found is that we help people that are high performers mm -hmm. that don't have a lot of time in their schedule be able to manage any sort of pain or discomfort mm -hmm. that might be getting in their way of their performance yeah. so they can sustain that for long term. And so a lot of the people that I see right now are um, runners who mm -hmm. have plantar fasciitis mm -hmm. and it's holding them up. And so I do dry needling is one of the treatments that I offer. I do a lot of just manual therapy in general. Mm -hmm. And then what I really work on with my clients that's different than I feel like the traditional setting is they don't have a lot of time. So sometimes they don't want to be doing a five page exercise yeah. program yeah. and they're definitely not doing their exercises in the corner. Like yeah. maybe they've had that experience yeah. in the past. Yeah. Um, so it's finding ways to fit things into their schedule that they can actually maintain. So yeah. sometimes that's people having a resistance band that they stick in their door at work because they can only get their exercises done at work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you can, and you can do a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I have briefly, so I had some shoulder issues way back some years ago, I had had a shoulder surgery and that was the only time I ever went to PT and I'll never forget whenever I was doing there before it, one of the, one of the most simple, th I don't know if you do this or not, but it just made me think of it. One of the most simple things they had me do was walk up to a wall and like face the wall. And, you know, I'm like an inch or two away from it. And I had like a ball that was maybe you could fit in the palm of my hand mm -hmm. and just like holding it up on a wall and just like rolling it around in a circle like this. And they're like, all right, go do 50 circles to your left and 50 circles to your right. I was like, I was like, okay, They whatever. just wanted to get their notes done. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, they were like, just keep them busy over there. But I, t I kid you not, like, it was the simplest things that I'd be doing. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what is... And now, I mean, granted, I just got into shoulder surgery, so that, you know, there's part of that. But it was the simplest things, like, they would do these little exercises, and, and I would... I would leave feeling, you know, tired, but also much better. And I never, I never realized just how effective the most simple of movements could be specifically in that context, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it was just, it was just interesting to me. Um, one thing I do want to ask you about, and this may sound like a silly question, but when you say, when you say high performers, mm -hmm. what exactly do you mean by that? Is it, is it specifically someone who, to me, like you mentioned, is it someone whose schedule is just like booked and busy from like 7 a.m. to 9 o'clock p.m.? Like they've just got 15 minutes of free time or what is it? What kind of criteria are you looking for with someone like that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think we kind of see the spectrum on that. So mm -hmm. it's more the people that would identify as a high performer, whether it's in their career mm -hmm. and they realize that to perform as well as they want to in their career, they have to uphold a certain level of physical health. Yeah. Um, or it's like one of my clients who just ran the Disney princess marathon and really? got fifth wow. in the entire marathon wow. and has to turn around and run Boston in a couple months. Oh my God. So she is just a different yeah. animal yeah. in terms yeah. of high performance. Oh, trust. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's <laughs> funny. I, at, at the time of this recording, so, uh, my fiance and I, we did the, the Chattanooga half marathon. Mm -hmm. That's the first race we ever did. And I, we finished like almost exactly two hours and 30 minutes. And I was like, oh, this is great. Like we were having a great time. And we, we hadn't been standing around for five minutes. And then the announcer guy was like, all right, folks, coming around the turn is the first marathon finisher. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he finished like 10 minutes behind us. And I was, just, I was just like, some people, like obviously you can train up to it. I'm not going to act like you can't improve and get better and faster and stronger. Um, but I was just like, man, some people are just just built differently. Like it's, it's just crazy. You know, it was crazy. A hundred percent. I think she ran, um, and she'll, hopefully I don't add too many seconds into her time, but I want to say it was like an average of six forty six, which I can hardly do that for a mile. I, so. I, I, I like to think that maybe I could do, I mean, I don't know. I'd have to I don't, test I don't myself. think I could actually, I don't what know. Am I saying if, hardly I'm maybe for like 0. 0.2 miles. Yeah. That's what I was about to say. Like, I know if I was doing that, I'd be really pushing it, but like, just the, I, I don't know. That just, just blows my mind. I was, I was actually watching not to get too much on a tangent now, but this is just part of my personality at this point. <laughs> I was watching earlier the footage of the guy who, uh, he, he was the first one to ever break a sub two hour marathon. Have you ever seen that footage? 
I don't know if I have. So if def, if you're listening and you haven't seen it, check it out. I forget his name. It's the only ever first sub two hour marathon. He ran a marathon in like an hour, 59 minutes and like 40 seconds. And his pace was like, it was like four, four minutes and 30 seconds. Like his average pace. And I was just like, what? <laughs> It's like, how's that even humanly possible? Anyways, it was just, it, it, the things the human body can do is crazy. It, it's amazing. But um, yeah, so something else I do want to ask you about, and I'm, I'm very curious about this as well. So you had mentioned dry needling and I had never heard, I'd never heard this term before. And I was kind of looking a little bit about your background and what it is that you do. And I just want to ask you like, what is dry needling? Cause to me, when I first think of that, like in a medical context, something that it reminds me of like acupuncture, is that kind of, in, am I in the right ballpark here? Or is that something at, at all foreign to what we're talking about? You're definitely in the right ballpark. Yeah. That's the most common question I get asked about it. So yeah. I always say it's acupuncture style needles. Mm -hmm. So same needles, but Western medicine philosophy. Okay. So I'm sure you've had a knot in your shoulder yes. before. Yes. So we go into those trigger points mm -hmm. in the muscle, put the needle in there, and that elicits a twitch response. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is it's like a really direct massage yeah. result. Like we can get into those deep muscle fibers, especially for like the low back and mm -hmm. some of the hip muscles that yeah. are super deep where you're not really getting to them with a massage. Mm -hmm. It can be super effective for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you mentioned the Western philosophy. What, what are the two in as, in as few or in as many words as you want to, <laughs> as you care to share, what are the two different like philosophies regarding that? So Western compared to Eastern, mm -hmm. so more of like the Chinese medicine background that acupuncture has where from my understanding, it's more based on energy meridians and energy flow. So you might see gotcha. needles local to the area of concern, but mm -hmm. you might also see them in different parts of the body. Gotcha. Typically we might um, go to different areas of the body if we feel like they're contributing to mm -hmm. the issue, but it's based off of like my musculoskeletal yeah. objective finding. Yeah. I don't know anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, that makes two of us. Uh, so, <laughs> but, but I was very curious about it because it seems to me like something I've noticed, and maybe this is just because I grew up in a small town and now I live in a bigger city and I've just seen more things and heard of and learned about more things. But it seems to me like these kind of uh, not somewhat non-traditional forms of wellness and medicine are picking up more steam in recent years. I don't know if I'm just making that assumption or if that's actually the case, but that's what it seems to be. And, and you know, the people, the conversations I have and the people that I talk to and things I see online, not that there is no merit to like, there certainly is merit to traditional forms of medicine, but, uh, things like what you do, like, I think I hear a lot of people talk about going and trying, like you're living proof that this is, uh, something that people are interested in. And so I think it's interesting, like, obviously I don't know much about this, this field, but I think it's interesting that there are kind of, as we like to say in the South, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to get to the same destination, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that this, this method of doing that is very interesting. Cause like you said, it's like a very extremely localized massage almost. And I don't know, just part of me is like, ew, needles. But also part of me is like, that sounds, you know, I like massages. You know? Yeah, like <laughs> for sure. Well, and the needles are super thin. Yeah. Like I've had people yeah. even be like, is it even in? Yeah. yeah. Um, so not to say that it can't be a little yeah. uncomfortable, but yeah, I feel like it's been a really effective tool for people that have like tried a lot of different things mm -hmm. and haven't found something that gives them a relief. Mm -hmm. But I think the other piece is like, we're busier than ever. Right. Mm -hmm. So as much as people, you know, even if they're wellness focused and they're willing to do some exercises, mm -hmm. like we all kind of want a quick fix, Yeah. you know, yeah. and I'm not saying dry needling is always a quick fix. Yeah. I usually like to tell people that I don't tend to give up on it until we do at least four sessions mm -hmm. for a building effect. But I mean, some people feel great after one Yeah. and when you go and you're going to, especially, you know, come see somebody like me that doesn't take insurance mm -hmm. for the reasons that I mentioned of why I left prior practices. Yeah. I know that people kind of want to walk out feeling a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. the exercise is a little bit more of a delayed yeah. effect. Yeah. So it's good for that buy-in piece, but it also physiologically is really good research behind yeah. it and people are loving it. So how did you, how did you find your way specifically working in this, in this specific, I mean, I'm sure you do other things other than just dry needling, but I, I find it very interesting. Like how did you find yourself specifically focused on this one field and kind of making it part of your expertise? 
Yeah. So when you're in PT school, the last year is all clinical rotations. Mm -hmm. And so my last rotation is the place that I ended up working in Wisconsin for a couple of years. And I had a fabulous mentor. Mm -hmm. His name is Kevin and he was my clinical instructor. And then he was my boss and he was also a dry needling instructor. Mm -hmm. So I watched him dry needle while I was still a student. I ended up getting certified when I was a student and then did the level two um, to basically be able to do all muscles in the body yeah. um, about six months later. And mm -hmm. so I really like learned it as an integral part of how I treated patients right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was just kind of like a really useful tool in my toolbox. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting though, because when I worked in Wisconsin, we would just kind of write off dry needling because mm -hmm. it's not covered by insurance. Yeah. So I was able to do it a ton. Mm -hmm. And then I moved here and we usually charge cash for it. So then I stopped doing it so much. Yeah. So I've kind of seen the balance of like when I like to use it and when not. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to take all of those pieces and like determine when it is a good plan for my patients. Yeah. So have you, you know, now that you've been doing this for a while and I'm, I'm imagining this to be the case, but if I'm just totally wrong, tell me, you know, you can say you're wrong. Uh, are, have there been any like misconceptions about dry needling or anything or like any assumptions about what it is or how it works or in, in, from your stand your perspective and your standpoint, have you had any like people come in that are averse to it for whatever reason that just are not founded, if that makes sense, you know? Um, if somebody is afraid of needles, I just don't even push yeah. it. I mean, I just don't even somebody yeah. passing out. Yeah. <laughs> my no, that, that is totally fair. That is totally fair. Yeah. And I have some people that are, I'll bring it up and they'll just be like, absolutely not. Yeah. And I feel like I have, like I said, it's a tool in my toolbox. Exactly. I feel like if they aren't interested in it, then mm -hmm. I have other things that I can do. Um, there are certain muscles where I'm like, oh, but it's like so yeah. deep in there. <laughs> the issue. Just, <laughs> just let me. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say. I kind of see the two sides, like the people that are unwilling to try mm -hmm. it and then the people that think it's like a one and done Yeah. Well, or they don't get a good result on the first one. And it's yeah. like, well, you've had this issue for eight months. Yeah. So three needles is yeah. probably not going to be your miracle <laughs> fix. Like I wish I was that good. But yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of the two sides of it. That's funny. That's funny. So you had mentioned, uh, you mentioned your boyfriend, he does chiropractic work as well. Do you do any work in that field at all? Or do you, are you, is that kind of strictly his domain and you let him do what he does over there and you do what you do on your side of things? Oh, that is a can of worms. <laughs> well, in as, in, as, <laughs> no, in, in as many, in as many or as few words as you care to answer that, you would totally find to answer that. <laughs> so it's like my running joke yeah. that it's a, it's amazing that I ended up with a chiropractor. Yeah. It's like karma. <laughs> for how much <laughs> crap I gave my family for like going to the chiropractor for literally everything when we were growing up. My cousin still goes yeah. to the chiropractor for everything. I've gotten them a little bit better trained. Yeah. But um, we, we have differing philosophies mm -hmm. usually, like just talking PT and chiropractors in general, which is why there's sometimes a little bit of beef there. <laughs> um, but like any field, it's a spectrum, you yeah. know, what happened is we just both agree and yeah. treat very similarly and mm -hmm. we just don't go into the nitty gritty details of our philosophies That's and we funny. get along great. That's funny. <laughs> but when we went on our first date, I called my mom and I was like, mommy's a chiropractor. I yeah. can't do it. <laughs> I was like, why am I going out with this chiropractor? It's never going to work out. And now I work with him. So yeah. I guess I ate my words. <laughs> well, still, I mean, I, I think something that's kind of cool about that is that again, I'm, I'm very like, this is not my expertise in any way. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to try to claim like it is, but I think at the very least, it's cool that your business offers varying solutions on that spectrum. Like if someone comes in and they're strictly looking for chiropractic solutions, well, you offer that. It may not be what you do specifically, but you offer that in house. I think that's cool that you seem to take a very open approach to finding whatever solution you need to find for whatever client you're working with, whether mm -hmm. it's dry needling or whatever it is, or it's, you know, chiropractic work, whatever. I think that's just cool that it's, it's somewhat of a, at least from what I can tell so far, it's somewhat of a, you know, there's more than one way to get there and whatever way the client prefers, whatever way you all collectively think is best, there's a way you can get there. And I just, I think that's interesting. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like in terms of a collaborative PT and chiropractic mm -hmm. practice in yeah. town, I think that we are the only one that functions like this, yeah. especially when we talk about the corporate wellness realm and what we do with that. But 
it really does allow us, like if somebody comes into us with a musculoskeletal issue, we feel confident that we have the bases covered with that. And yeah. sometimes it looks like they see both of us mm -hmm. and we love the idea of expanding our offerings more for just kind of routine wellness care and how we both fit into that picture. So yeah. that's been cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. So correct me if I'm wrong here. I read, a little, I was reading a little bit just about your background on LinkedIn and, and different things. And I read that you have some experience working with concussions in some way. Is that, am I, is that correct? Okay. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you a little bit about this because so I, I, I've always been a fan of sports and I've grown, I grew up playing sports. I played football a little bit when I was younger and played basketball all the way through high school, loved it all my life. And I mean, you know, if you keep up with sports in any way, especially regarding the NFL, there's been a lot of talk about concussion protocol, about the effects of concussions, especially in recent years with the way medicine has evolved and the way we can uh, detect these things and just the way we see them. And I think it's a very interesting topic because in a lot of, from my perspective, it seems like there are a lot of rules like this is what a concussion is and this is how it's treated and this is what we do but there are also a lot of i guess i'll use the word unknowns uh like for instance you know specifically regarding the nfl you know you'll see different people suffer suffer from concussions and the kind of protocol is a little bit up in the air it's like okay what do we do with this person was it really that serious did they have a concussion you know it there's a there can be a lot of gray areas and so i want to ask you just a little bit kind of if we can like unpack this a little bit, like what it is, because I see a lot of discourse about it specifically if someone, you know, and you know, whether they're a prominent sports player or anything, if they suffer a concussion, whether it be at a young age or at, a, at an older age and the ra different ramifications of that. And I just want to kind of hear your thoughts on that. on like what it is that you do, what you make of all this and just your thoughts on that in general. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think this topic is so interesting, yeah. right? Cause like when it comes down to it, there is a business mm -hmm. that's backing this. And when we look at concussion, there's so much of it that's subjective, mm -hmm. um, especially like a lot of the outcome tools that we use. So we rely on some of these athletes to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. And they honestly want to play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's always going to be a component of that. So I think we miss a lot of those like gray area concussions mm -hmm. yeah. where they probably would benefit from a little bit more time and yeah. recovery, but they don't have a lot of the glaring symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and so unfortunately, I think that's what we're seeing with like these long-term outcomes, mm -hmm. you know, and some of the studies that they've had with some of these retired NFL players. Mm -hmm. And that's just going to be the reality of it is yeah. that we won't fully know like yeah. the additive effect of these multiple concussions, especially because, you know, you think of the concussions reported, you wonder how many are not. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Especially with all these hits and yeah. they shake it off yeah. and, you know, there's probably so many like minor traumas yeah. that build up too. Yeah. So... I mean, I'm a huge football fan. Yeah. Like I get it, yeah. but it's just, um, it's, a, it's a scary thing yeah. because we can't really objectify it yeah. until we start to see the long-term effects of it. Yeah. Well, and, and that's, that's what it seems to be. And I find it somewhat interesting that again, from my perspective, it seems like there are a lot of apps, like there's a lot of truths and absolutes in the medical field. It's like, there's a lot of things we know. And like, if, you know, if this, if a comes up, then we know to treat it with B, if C comes up, we know to treat it with D mm -hmm. and not that everything is figured out, but it seems to me like the area of concussions, at least, and specifically regarding sports, it's still kind of like, we're still kind of figuring it out to a degree. And I, I, I remember a while back, it was in high school. We were watching some documentary. I don't even remember why or what it was, but it was pertaining to uh, concussion protocols in, in like in professional sports. And, you know, it was talking about how some people make the argument like a concussion is the very obvious ones. You know, if you see someone, they get slammed down and they, they hit their head on the ground and they're laying there. It's like, okay, yeah, like obviously there's something going on there. Like that needs to be treated. But then, like you said, there's also the argument to maybe like, what about all the minor traumas? Like, you know, you, you, we're talking about kind of talking about football here. You think of the, the two different lines there, they're hitting each other every single play and you know, they're not all falling over on the field, but over time, that's obviously going to take a toll on their body physically, but you have to consider also your head, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I just think it's very fascinating because like you said, I know from the perspective of an athlete who had no money on the line, who was just doing it for fun. Like if you get injured, you, a lot of times you still want to, you want to be out there. Like if there's a chance, if you, you know, if you're, if your trainer is like, Hey, you're going to be about 
85 percent but you can play you're gonna go play you know like I, I did that in in high schools at times like I remember I hurt my foot once and it wasn't perfectly back in in you know perfect shape but I could play and I was like I'm gonna go play and so I imagine when there's millions of dollars on the line and your career is on the line you're gonna take whatever chance you can to get back on the field or back on the court whatever it is even if it means you know some unknowns down the line, and I, I just think that's really interesting. I don't know, it, it, in kind of a weird way. I think it's very interesting that we have that approach to it. You know, absolutely. It's funny you say that about your foot because yeah. I would literally wear my walking boot to basketball <laughs> games senior year, take yeah. it off, play, put it back on. I mean, I was a bad patient. So yeah. you can imagine if there is that level of subjectivity yeah. to like how you feel in. Mm -hmm. And then we add adrenaline into yeah. the mix. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like sometimes you're like, I feel great. And then yeah. you get home, you're like, I got yeah. hit by a train. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. No, no, I had I had that exact thing. And, you know, I'll spare most of the details. So if anybody listening has a weak stomach or anything, but basically <laughs> I, I hurt my foot during one game and it was like right before halftime. And, you know, to say the least, my foot wasn't looking great. And, you know, it would have taken any any person with a pair of eyes to be like, you don't need to be playing right now. But in the moment, I was like, okay, well, my shoe is still on my foot. I can play, right? <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's okay. Like, we can keep my shoe on there, and I'm fine, and it feels a little weird, but it's good. Just tape it on. Yeah, and, and I went out there and played for, like, 30 more seconds, and then the coach was like, no, you gotta you gotta come. This is not, this is not working. You're barely getting up and down the court. Like, this is not working. So, but I, I think it's interesting because where do you – where do you draw that line? Like you said, especially when you get to professional sports, like there are careers on the line. There are not only the careers of the people on the field, but everybody involved in that. It, you know, you think of uh, you think of the the greatest player on any team. If they go down, that means a lot for the for the for the the teams and the business behind it. Where do you draw that line? Do you do you take every person off the field whenever they have a minor hit, or do you only do it when there's a very obvious concussion? I just I think it's very interesting, and it's something that like you said, for better or for worse, we're going to learn more details about it and learn kind of the realities of it as time goes on. And I don't really know if there's any other way around it other than that, than that, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, I think it's going to take some of the really severe things happening. Like I think we saw it with Hamlin this year mm -hmm. and then yeah. with Tua and yeah. his like severe concussion and yeah. some of the things that we saw there, like some of those things have to happen. And yeah. I was pleased with how that was handled this year but it's like yeah we try to make strides in mm -hmm. equipment but like the reality is is like whether you have that helmet on like your head's still bobbing when yeah. you're bobbing around yeah yeah and, <laughs> we and, can't stop it completely yeah and there's so many unknowns like you know i mean you can you can look at uh you know the the changes in the equipment that like football players use compared to like I don't know, in the fifties, whenever the NFL started and they were just, they just had like leather caps on and they were running around. Like, obviously they're probably in a little bit better protected with at legit helmets and shoulder pads and things like that. And those are, those are necessary, but at the same time, there's only so many contingencies you can plan for mm -hmm. when you have someone, you know, of like, you know, they're six, seven, 200 something pounds flying at somebody else for, you know, four quarters of a game that's not normal for me, you know, like that's not a normal thing to, I don't know about you guys, but normally when I'm walking to my place of work, there's not people like swarming me, you know? So it, it, it's just, it's very, it's, it's such a unique set of circumstances because there's so many different conflicting things. Obviously you want the safety and health of the player to be paramount. Like you don't want them hurt. You didn't, whether they're the player or not, you don't want anybody hurt, but at the same time, you have their emotions and thoughts about it. You have the business side of it all. Like it's just such a interesting mix of, of, of things at play that I don't know what the best way forward is. It's, it's just, it's really interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. I almost did professional sport. Like that was my goal when really? I went into PT school. I was like, I want to do professional sports. Yeah. And then I met some of the guys in my class and I was like, yeah. you're way more like <laughs> dedicated to this than I am and the schedule, but you couldn't pay me enough to be in that concussion tent trying to determine somebody's like trajectory with that much on the line. So, so like, what do you, do, I don't know specifically like what you do with, with, uh, concussions, but like, what is kind of the protocol with that? Because I mean, obviously it's going to be, you know, I, it's going to be different on the, on an NFL field with a crowd around you and you're in a little cramped tent and you know, they're got, they're sweaty and got all stuff on. But like, what is the protocol for that? Because I've seen people 
I have never been diagnosed with a concussion. I don't, I've never had like major head trauma or anything, but I've, I know people that have had concussions. I've seen people get concussions and like very violent concussions. And sometimes it's very obvious, but like, it's not like you're dealing with someone where like, if my hand was broken and it's very obvious, like you can see it and you, you can treat it. But when you're dealing with trauma to the head, things seem to get like, I would imagine things get a little bit more gray. Like what is the protocol around that? What do you even, where do you even start with that? Yeah. I mean, luckily we've come a long way from like leaving people in dark rooms yeah. like we used to. Um, and I think this is kind of a, a trend for like physical therapy in general and mm -hmm. the way that we rehab injuries mm -hmm. is a lot more focused on active recovery. Mm -hmm and knowing when to begin some gentle levels of exercise, even if it's just biking, you know, yeah. like stationary bike. Yeah. And then it's really based on the severity of the concussion for how we start to implement that. But with all of my clients, the first day that I see them is like a full body diagnostic. So with the concussion eval, what I'm really looking at is like, how are their eye movements? Mm -hmm. Are they dizzy? You know, yeah. what's that look like? How's their balance? Mm -hmm. Can they do a like dual task of counting or catching something while they balance? And I put all of that information together and I look at, you know, how's their neck motion? Are we seeing any like guarding in their muscles? And we look at all of that stuff and create a really customized plan. Um, but I would say the overarching theme is like, getting people moving mm -hmm. at a slight level as early as possible to yeah. help the body kind of heal itself. If you have someone come in and, and maybe you suspect that they have a concussion or they're exhibiting concussion like symptoms, are they ever surprised at how, cause I mean, you know, concussion is obviously trauma to the brain and it's not like, you know, again, if your hand is broken, obviously your hand is going to be the thing that, you know, you're going to have a hard time grabbing things and picking things up. But you know, your brain works with everything you do, you know, are they ever surprised at how like difficult it might be to do something? Like you said, like pick up something and count to 10 at the same time. Like, do they ever find like, Oh my gosh, like I didn't realize it's difficult for me to focus on one thing at a time right now. Is, have they ever had moments like that? Yeah. I think it can be really humbling, right? <laughs> like, you know, they're like, Oh, I was out just out playing football or whatever yeah. they were doing yeah. before. And then you have them try to walk a straight line and like yeah. do math. Yeah. And they fail terribly and they're yeah. like, okay, maybe I'm not a hundred percent or they're like crazy light or sound sensitive mm -hmm. and have a hard time with just like, you know, all the input that comes from the appointment. And yeah. that's kind of eye opening too. Yeah. what I'm seeing a lot more of than concussions, especially in my new practice is just like dizziness mm -hmm. and, um, vestibular issues. So balance mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So taking kind of pieces of what I see with concussion mm -hmm. and I've been doing a lot more work with that kind of stuff too. And the dizziness, you know, that's, that's pretty like a, yeah. whatever it takes to get rid of that. Yeah. People are usually down. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. If you're walking around, you can't stand up straight. That's a yeah. pretty, pretty important thing I would imagine. Yeah. So they're usually well aware of their yeah. impairments yeah. <laughs> when it comes to that. <laughs> that's funny. Um, so you said this is a little bit off topic, but I, I do want to ask, you said you're a football fan. Are you college NFL, something else, X, XFL or okay. So, yeah. so I went what to the university your... of Wisconsin okay. for PT school. So I'm a Badger fan, which okay. was unfortunate this year. <laughs> I mean, it was a really humbling year to be a Wisconsin sports fan. Like we are so spoiled. Yeah. But it was rough for the Badgers. I'm a Packers fan. You're a Packers fan. How timely okay. with Aaron Rodgers. Okay, probably. that's what that's what I wanted to ask. <laughs> I was I was curious if you're if you're a Packers fan. So let let the record stand. I, this I don't know necessarily when this when this episode will come out yet. But at the time of this recording, it is 6:15 p.m. March 14th of 2023. What are your current like? I think free agency has like just started. Like, what are your current like feelings and thoughts around this? Because I mean, I, I've been following, so I, funny enough, I'm a Vikings fan, not from Minnesota, but I just really liked the color purple and was a big fan of Adrian <laughs> Peterson. Thought he was cool. I Anyways, won't hold that against me. Well, I'm, I'm not like, I'm not like diehard. I'm just like, I like purple and the horn and the, you know, the helmets are cool. But anyways, <laughs> anyways, I've been kind of loosely following, you know, the Vikings and Packers are, are big rivals. And so I always mm -hmm. keep track of what's going on. And there's been talk of in previous years of Aaron Rodgers, like, is he going to retire? Is he going to be traded? Is he going to whatever? But it seems very like very real this year. What are your thoughts currently? Like, do you think he's going to retire? You think he's going to, there's a lot of talk around the jets. What are your, what are your thoughts on that right now? At this, I mean, something could change tomorrow. So this yeah. may be very outdated, very wrong. I don't know, but at this very <laughs> moment, I'm curious. 
I definitely think he's gone. <laughs> yeah, I think. In, in what way, though? In I think way? he's going to the Jets, you think especially because so? the uh, rumor has it that Cobb just went to the Jets, oh, and really? that's like his right hand man. Yeah. So I feel like the writing's on the wall. Honestly, Brett Favre spent some time at the Jets. It's only Isn't right that, that we just have Packers. That's what, well, that's the thing. That's <laughs> So whenever I became a Vikings fan was around the time whenever Brett Favre went to the Vikings. And I, I didn't realize before that that he was, you know, he was with the, the Packers for a long time. And then he briefly was with the Jets. And so now that I'm kind of retroactively learning these stories, I'm like – is Aaron Rodgers going to come to the Vikings here in a couple? Of, like maybe that's going to have like, is, is this, the, is this just the trajectory of every Packers QB? I don't, I don't know. I think it's, it, it's, you could it, only hope. Yeah. I mean, you know, who knows by that point, I don't know, but yeah, by that point is right. I mean, I yeah. think like New York is probably more of his vibe. Yeah. Small town Green Bay. It's yeah. not really fitting his personality. But he's, but he's from, he's from like California though, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, he's been, he's been all across the, you know, he's from California. He played there in college. He lived in little Green Bay. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. It just, it's interesting to me that there's a, there's much you can say about the way the Packers have handled everything they've done in recent years with the Jordan Love saga and everything that's gone on and just ev everything that's happened. But to me, like, I don't know. It seems like at this point in his career, I mean, obviously I don't know the guy, so I don't know what he wants, <laughs> but, you know, me speculating from, you know, a thousand feet away from him, like, it seems to me like he could he could get maybe what he's wanting to get at in New York in at the Packers. You know, like, there are still good players in Green Bay. There's still really good, good players there. And I don't know. It's interesting to me that that's the team. To me, if I was going to go somewhere, I'd want to be like – Kind of like what Brady did with the Buccaneers. It's like, I want to go somewhere that like needs just me. And now we're going to like, we are primed for a Super Bowl. I don't know. To me, I, I think the Jets is an interesting choice. If that is what happens, who know, it could come out in the next 30 minutes. If that's where I, I, I don't know. But I think that's interesting that that's where a lot of the talk is around, you know, right now. Yeah, for sure. I knew that this past season was going to be a little bit rough yeah. because just our receivers in yeah. general, like we've just had so much fluctuation and, yeah. I mean, I loved Jordy Nelson. Yeah. I thought he was like one of a kind, yeah. especially with Rogers. And yeah. so I was happy to see like Cobb come back because that was a good connection. But other than that, it was just like the lack of trust for rookie receivers. Yeah. And it's like if he's not willing to build anything new at Green Bay, then maybe yeah. it's time to move on. Yeah, and he's he's been there for a, a long. I mean, he's been there his whole career, uh, and it's it's I can't remember a time when he wasn't there. And so it's it's just. It's crazy. Uh, t to me, I don't know. To me, part of me is just like, dude, if it was me, I'd just, I'd just say, you know what? I won a Super Bowl. I've got more money than I know what to do with. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, wherever he wants to go, whether like, I'm being like, you know what? I'm just going to hang it up and just enjoy the rest of my early retirement, you know? Mm -hmm. but it's, it's an addiction, I think. I'm, yeah. And, and again, like, just like what we were talking about, like, I get it when you, when you love something like that, like, it's not as simple as being like, eh, well, I'll just stop and I'll just go and retire on a boat somewhere and be, you know, whatever. Like maybe for some, it's as simple as that, but you know, when you're when you are the, you know, arguably when you're debated as, are you the best ever? Like you're going to, you're going to have some skin in the game, you know? So absolutely. And I, yeah. I think he wants to probably outlast Brady at this yeah. point. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so have you, how, how have you been like diehard Packers your whole life? Like Packers fan? My family was not really like a big sports family. Yeah. My dad actually raced cars when I was growing oh, up. Really? So I grew up like riding four wheelers yeah. and he like raced dirt bikes and then he raced midgets, which yeah. is like a sprint car without yeah. a wing. So yeah. we spent every weekend at the racetrack. Yeah. So it wasn't until I got a little bit older and I started playing like basketball and stuff myself. And then obviously Wisconsin, it's hard to like live without yeah. getting exposed to the Green Bay Packers. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't really know when that turning point was, but it wasn't as a result of like my dad being a big football yeah. fanatic. Yeah. I probably watched more football, yeah. you know, in my life so far than he ever has in yeah. his entire life. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. So my, I, I don't know what it was again. I think it's just partly, I just enjoy the color purple and I just like their helmets and you know, why not? like everybody around here where I'm from, they're like, they're either Falcons fans or Titans fans. I think part of me was like, I'm going to pick a team very far away from here just for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah. But my dad, he is a huge Bengals fan and they have been, I mean, they've been terrible for so, so long. And like, just, I mean, they've, for as long as I've been alive, they've been never been a good team, but I mean, here in recent years, like they're, they've been really, really good. And so it's been cool getting to see him like finally get to enjoy his team for once and like see them win games and go to the playoffs and do the things that 
teams normally do, you know. His so loyalty paid yeah, off. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I'd feel bad for him. Like sometimes, even when I was younger, like you know, whenever Andy Dalton was there, like they would consistently just be kind of like average, not great, not terrible, just kind of like eh, whatever. And I was like, man, are they ever like you know? It's like it's not like it's a big market. Like is anybody ever gonna you know pull them through? But Joe Burrow seems like the truth. So yep. you know, yep. it's they're turning it around. Yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, it was funny. He actually got to go to the, the, I forget what game it was. He got to go and see, see them play the, the only NFL game he ever got to go to. He's ever been to so far was the game where they beat the Titans on that. Like last, it was a, it was like a last minute cute, uh, field goal. And it was cool seeing him go to that. So, uh, oh, that's that was awesome. pretty cool. Yeah. Um, anyways, sorry for the, uh, the tangent on that. I just, I knew that you, I, I, I was pretty sure I was like, she said she was from Wisconsin. She likes football. I was like, okay, she's probably, probably a Packers fan. So yeah, it's honestly yeah. nice to talk about football a little bit because yeah. I'm just in the thick of basketball. <laughs> uh, my boyfriend's brother, he's an associate head coach at a D2 school really? and they're actually number one in the nation. They play tonight in the sweet 16. So what, what, what's, what school is it's it? It's Nova Southeastern in Fort Lauderdale. Is that in, Fort Lauderdale and uh, in Florida? In Florida, okay. yeah. And so they're like thirty-three or thirty-four and zero this year. And wow. Yeah. So we have, and it's just a big basketball family. His dad coached. Yeah. He coached for a while. So it's yeah. nice to talk about football instead of basketball. Well, it, well, it's funny. Like my whole my family has and still is is a basketball family. Like like I played basketball my whole life. My sister played basketball through high school into college. My younger sister is currently playing. But like we are. We, I don't know how this happened, but we just are a basketball family, and it's funny. My, my fiance, she, she I mean, she didn't, she, she was very much not a bass. Like she wasn't <laughs> head over her heels like I was whenever I was younger. And so, like, she'll come home with me sometimes and like hang out with me and the family. And like, whenever we come back to Chattanooga, she'll be like, "You guys do watch a lot of basketball, don't you?" I'm like, "Yeah, we just, it's just kind of like most people watch the news. We just have basketball games playing on in the background. You know, that's just kind of what we do for yep, whatever that's reason." My life. So, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. So he's coaching in Florida. Interesting. Yeah. Yep. That's crazy. How did it, how did he find himself down there? I honestly am not a hundred percent sure on the connection there other than knowing that the head coach that he works with, yeah. he had that connection back when he played in college. Yeah. And so I think it was something where he followed him down there to work underneath him. Nice. Um, but yeah, they've had two undefeated seasons in a row. Wow. Um, so we're hoping that maybe they can pull it off and we can go see them in Indiana next nice. week in the championship. Well, I wish, them, <laughs> I wish them the best of luck. I wish them the best of luck. Yeah. Um, Kind of coming back a little bit to what we've been talking about before. Uh, so something I do want to ask you about, I think that I think a lot of people partly due to the advent of the internet, uh, for better or for worse, there's a lot of good things that have happened for people's health because of it. And there's a lot of bad things that have happened because of people, you know, for people's health because of it. Uh, but I think that one of the main benefits of specifically regarding people's health, uh, that the internet and just us being connected has helped has allowed is the fact that the understanding of and the ability to translate uh, ways to improve your health is more available to you now. Like, you know, I would not be having this conversation with you if it wasn't for the fact that I could meet you online and, and come here and learn about the things that you do. And so uh, specifically regarding kind of the realm that you work in and the things that you do, what are some simple like ways that you recommend or that people can take advantage. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm not saying go try dry needling on your own at home, but <laughs> specifically kind of regarding what you do and what you see, are there any like ways that people can apply the things that they may see when they come into your office in their own life, maybe at home or at work or something simple to improve their health in a general way? I mean, obviously you don't have to get too specific with it, but some just general ways that people can apply the things that you do in their own life to improve their health. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think that one of the big things that I'm trying to work on with my clients is having them realize that like pain is not normal mm -hmm. and pain is not necessarily a price that we have to pay for getting older. Mm -hmm. And so not just writing off like discomfort that's lingering mm -hmm. and waiting until it blows up into this big issue. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, even if that is trying a little bit of DIYing, you know, mm -hmm. like you said, you can find so much stuff. So it's like, as soon as something starts to bother you, you know, start to do a little bit of research and yeah. figure out, you know, what movements can I do if mm -hmm. I'm feeling really tight in this area? Um, and just kind of being more in tune with your bodies. Mm -hmm. Cause I think sometimes we go so long without checking in with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we're like, 
oh, now I've had this issue and it's been lasting me for yeah. weeks at a time. Yeah. Or every time I do this, it bothers me. Um, and it's just like finding that time to implement a little bit of like self care. Yeah. And that's where, you know, when I talk about like the high performers with busy schedules, mm -hmm. that's where we help to speed that up because now we're overloaded with information. Mm -hmm. So sometimes like taking that time to try to figure it out on your own, yeah. it's just not in the cards for people mm -hmm. that are too busy. And that either means they have to seek help from us yeah. or they have to just continue to put it off. And then yeah. we don't know what that could spiral into. I think something too, that's, you know, take, this with a grain of salt, but I think something that is worth considering, and, and I've followed some different people that talk about health and fitness online is, you know, there are a lot of generalities when it comes to your health. It's like, you know, you should exercise. Yes. Like generally, like if you exercise generally, that's a good thing. Like that can mean a lot of different things, but generally speaking, yeah, you should eat a healthy diet generally. Sure. What does, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can take that, but generally mm -hmm. speaking, yeah, like you should. Uh, but something that, you know, I've seen some things online is you should understand these generalities and yes, try to apply them, but also understand, like you were saying, what specifically do you need in your own life? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, not to say that you should just kind of make up your own like medical term. It's like, well, I feel <laughs> like, you know, three double cheeseburgers will make me feel better. So that's, what's going to be my <laughs> prescription for the day. But understanding, like you said, if you are, a la if you had the capability to be in tune with your body and understanding, okay, maybe I feel a little bit weird in, in this way. Maybe I've got a kind of a weird pain in my side today. Like that wasn't there before. You shouldn't just write it off and say, oh, well, whatever. Like I'm doing all the other things that I should, like I'm exercising and have a healthy diet. I'm doing all the things like it's probably fine. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But I, I think you met, you raise a good point of being in tune with your body and understanding when things, even if in a small way are kind of out of whack or are, 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 uh, are abnormal, you know, because things can quickly spiral. I would imagine, uh, to a point where, you know, suddenly that small pain in your side has turned into something much bigger and much worse. And it's something that you, you must deal with immediately. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something that's worth considering is like I said, not just making up your own medical prescriptions, but being in tune with your body and, you know, thinking, yes, there are health generalities that I can apply to my life, but also understanding that your body is your own and your experience is going to be different than other people in their bodies. And so, knowing what today feels like compared to yesterday is an important thing, I think, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, during COVID, like there was a little bit of a transition to telehealth, yeah. even for physical therapy, which for me, you know, being relatively new out of school, I was like, how in the world am I going to do telehealth <laughs> for, you know, all of my hands-on patients? Yeah. So it made me start to think about how to make things more accessible for people. Mm -hmm. And it just comes down to like, like I said, there's that overload of things that you can find. Mm -hmm. And in, the only way to truly get something customized for your body is to like have somebody look and see what are your deficits mm -hmm. in strength, flexibility, you know, like why are you having this pain? And that's what we really try to help people uncover is not just the, yeah, your back hurts. Here's yeah. the top three back pain exercises <laughs> that you can find on TikTok. You know, yeah. it's okay, your back hurts. Is it because your hip flexors are so tight because you sit at your desk all day? Yeah. Is it because you don't use your glutes when you squat and you yeah. started this new workout routine? Like, what's yeah. the why? Yeah. Because if we don't figure that out, then it's really hard to get to the root of the problem and prevent future issues from happening. That's something you, you remind me of. That's something that just... I never, I don't know why, but it never like occurred to me. And again, this is showing the fact that I have no medical degree in any way. Uh, <laughs> but my sister, she, my older sister, she is a, uh, she is a strength and conditioning coach and which is obviously very different than what we're talking about, but she knows much more about the human body than mm -hmm. I do. And it was funny one time she was at home for something. We were all at home and she was talking about, you know, like a lot of people, they have, they say their hips hurt. Like they have very tight hips or they say that like they've been sitting all day and like it hurts here or whatever. But like you said, a lot of times if you have a, a pain in, in your lower back, it may not be because there's a problem with your lower back. It may be because, you know, this is connected to that, which is connected to this. And the problem is actually down here and this other yeah. spot, which if you could alleviate this common issue on a totally different spot, you know, part of your body, it would kind of up the chain of your, of your body, alleviate these different issues. And that, again, like I said, kind of towards uh, the beginning, we were talking about running. The human body is an amazing thing. It's, it's amazing how, uh, oftentimes the solutions to these issues are not just, Oh, you have a pain in this spot. Well, we'll fix the pain in that spot. It's a much more, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's like a chain of events almost, you know, at least from my perspective, I just, I just think that's very interesting, you know? Yeah, no, that is 
so accurate. Yeah. So, so accurate. And that's the thing that I think can sometimes get missed when people are overloaded. Mm -hmm. Like I was in a traditional setting Yeah. <laughs> or when they're just hyper-focused on the issue is like, okay, well, what's going on at the foot and ankle mm -hmm. in these runners? Yeah. You know, why do they have back pain? Cause like you said, it could be a problem way down the chain and we have to address all those different mm -hmm. pieces. So yeah. that's like the puzzle of my job, yeah. which is fun. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, well, we are, uh, nearing the, the hour mark of the show and, and I don't want to hold you too much longer, but, uh, first and foremost, I want to just say thank you very much for coming on. It's been, uh, a pleasure talking to you. I was, I was talking with my fiance, uh, yesterday before, and I was just telling her how, you know, I had interview and stuff. And that's why I said, I'm, I'm really, really excited for this one because a lot of times I'll go into interviews and I try to have as much knowledge of, you know, what they know or what they're passionate about, what they're excited about beforehand. But like, this was, you know, a conversation with you is something that I know some things about from a, from a very surface level standpoint, but after I was like, I don't know a ton about like what she knows about. So I'm excited to kind of challenge myself and, and have this conversation with her. So I appreciate you coming in and, and hopefully uh, my ramblings about the different things made some sense to you. Uh, but before we finish, uh, I have a kind of fun way I like to end each episode before uh, just as a way to have some fun and finish the episode. I like to do a quick segment where I have 15 quick questions for you mm -hmm. and they are this or that questions. And so I want to ask these questions to you. I want to get your just feelings off the top of your head, what you're thinking. So either A or B, hot or cold, just what you're feeling in this moment. Um, and I promise none of these have to do anything with the Packers. So you won't have to worry about that at all. <laughs> uh, but I just want to ask you 15 quick questions, see what you think. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get you out of here. How does that sound to you? That sounds great. All right. This is 15 quick questions. What do you prefer, beach vacation or mountain vacation? Beach. All right. Uh, do you prefer hot coffee or iced coffee? Or you can hot. substitute tea. Do you prefer, you prefer hot? Hot black coffee. Oh, see, you're, you are you are <laughs> speaking my language. I, I've said it many times. I am a, I'm a hot coffee. You're, I'll, I'll drink hot coffee in the middle of summer. Like, it's just I don't, something about it. I don't know. Um, all right. Which, which uh, season do you prefer, summer, fall, winter, or spring? fall now that I live in the South. <laughs> it might have been summer in Wisconsin, but not anymore. We do. We, we are, I will say, especially in this area, we are definitely spoiled with fall. I mean, the, the leaves changing and the weather, it's, it's, it's good stuff. Yes. Uh, sweet or savory food? Savory. I agree. Are Crocs fashionable? Yes or no? Ooh, don't tell Johnny's brother, Jordan, but no. Johnny's brother, Jordan, don't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he's getting a kickback from Crocs. Um, all right. Pineapple on pizza. Yes or no? Yes. Oh, good. I'm so good. I, I'm a, I'm a, I love pineapple. And Just jalapenos. In, yes. Add it all. Yes. Uh, sunrise or sunset? Mm, sunset. Nice. Uh, guacamole or salsa? Guacamole. Card games or board games? Card games. Card games are fun. Euchre. Have you ever heard of that game? I think, I, I think I've heard game. of it. Okay, or so a listen, northern game. I so listen, I, I played board games the most growing up, but I've come to learn more and appreciate card games as I've gotten older. So I'm, I know some of the names, but like... I'm still learning how to play like Rook and stuff. Like I'm, I'm not great at it, but I think I've heard of it before. My 85 year old grandma taught Johnny how to play Euchre at Christmas and it was the funniest <laughs> thing ever. She was not very patient. She's like, play that one. It's funny. My, uh, my brother, my brother-in-law, he, his whole family, like since the day he was born, they played card games and he just, it seems like he knows every single kind of card game you can ever play. And whenever we're like in for the holidays or we're just, you know, there for in, like we're in the same place together. We'll have a little bit of time off and he's like, you guys want to play a card game? I'll be like, yeah, sure. And he'll be like, All right, this game is called upside down potato stack. And then we're going to play that. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, what, where, what is this? What, what do you mean? What is this game? I'm, I'm used to Monopoly. What are we? Anyways, <laughs> I think the, all the different kinds of card game names are hilarious oh, to me. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Next question. Crunchy peanut butter or smooth peanut butter? Mm, smooth. Would you rather read the book or see the movie? Read the book. Nice. Um, who wins in a dance battle? The Rock or Kevin Hart? Kevin Hart. Nice. He's uh, lower to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of my philosophy too. Um, all right. Last three questions here. Which decade do you prefer? 70s, 80s, or 90s? 90s. Nice. Um, of the kind of final four um, holidays in the year, which do you prefer? Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, or New Year's? 
Christmas. Nice. I'm, I'm big. I, I start celebrating Christmas in September. I love big, big fan of Christmas. All right. And finally, last question. I ask this of everybody. I want to hear your answer, but also your rationale behind your answer. Would you rather fight 100 duck sized horses or one horse sized duck? So you got a bunch of, a bunch of small horses or one really, really big duck, the size of a horse, which, which of these two would you rather, rather compete against? I think the hundred duck sized horses. Okay. So what's your, what's your line of thinking here with this? Um, I just think that I'd be less intimidated <laughs> if they're down by my ankles. <laughs> and I think maybe they'd be kind of cute. I don't know. I'm less intimidated. By so, the so your philosophy is like, is like tame them, like make them like your horse, your yeah. horse legion. Okay. Yeah. I grew up on a dairy farm too. Yeah, so yeah. like, I think I could herd those things. I got you. I got you. <laughs> my, my family would be like, she did nothing. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> I, I was pretty young when we had the farm, but I love still, it. I'm claiming that. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Uh, well, that is all the questions I got for you. Thank you for playing along. I appreciate it. Before we finish up, uh, do you have any like links or anything to maybe like websites or social media handles or anything like that you'd like to share before we finish up? Yeah. So our website is um, keytochangewellness.com. And then everything on social media is K2, the number two, C wellness. So you can find us on there. And then I have my own Instagram of Kelly Mueller. Nice. Awesome. Well, I will make sure those links are in the description. So if you're listening and you want to check them out, I highly recommend uh, giving her a follow. I know you're on LinkedIn as well. Uh, so if you're on LinkedIn, which is the way that I came across you. Uh, so if you're on LinkedIn, want to connect, I'll put that description down there. If you're on all the other socials or want to check out the website or anything, all those links will be in the description. So definitely go check those out if you'd like to see what Kelly's got going on. But, uh, yeah, Kelly, again, thank you very much for coming in today. I appreciate you coming in and chatting with me and it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. And to everyone listening, thank you very much as always for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. As I mentioned, all the links will be in the description. Uh, if you'd like to contact myself, uh, regarding anything uh, regarding the show or anything that will be in the description as well. Uh, but yeah, all the links will be down there. Thank you as always for tuning in and listening, and I will catch you all on another episode of the podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the podcast. As one final reminder, if you'd like to support the show, then don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you get your podcast or share it with a friend. If you'd like to check out any links that were mentioned during the show or follow the show or myself on social media, then feel free to head to the description of today's episode to find these links. As always, thank you again for checking out today's episode, and I really hope you enjoyed it. I will catch you all on the next episode of the podcast. See ya.